Kane Smith, you are the founder and the executive producer of Vice and uh, Vice Media and Vice Land. You have your you have your hands in all sorts of things right now. Um, uh, for those who don't know, could you uh, give us a refresher on how did Vice begin and how did it transform into what it is today? We started as a, a magazine, a sort of a free magazine in Montreal, Canada. Um, and then we moved to New York around 98, 99, which was kind of like, you know, coming from Reykjavik or something. People were like, how do these, you know, French Canadians know, you know, about sneakers? Um, so we moved to New York. We were part of the first sort of dot-com bust, the e-commerce bust around 2000, 2001. We moved to Brooklyn um, as Brooklyn started blowing up. And we started doing online sort of TV, what was called at the time TV over IP, otherwise known as online video. Um, and then we expanded sort of around the world to now we're in 80 countries. And we do TV, we do a lot of well, mobile is our fastest growing. We do online, we, we're the largest video producer in the world, the largest millennial library in the world. Um, and we do television, online, mobile, agency, we have record labels, we have magazines, we have books, we have, we're a media company. And how did that, uh, where was the first branch out uh, from your from your magazine uh, into another sort of media field? Um, online, so that was the first dot-com bust. And so we came out of that with a healthy disregard for the internet and had to be sort of dragged kicking and screaming back in um, but we were some of the first to do online video and then native advertising. And then it, it took us about 10 years to get to a million copies of the magazine. And then it took us about a year to get to 10 million uniques a month. So we realized our future was digital. So um, your, uh, where did the idea come from to uh, start a, a, news, uh, a news magazine program on uh, HBO? Were you looking to do something for HBO or just something more broad in general? That's a good story, actually. Uh, I had been doing um, online videos, you know, sort of the biggest ones were, you know, the Cannibal Warlords of Liberia, or, you know, we snuck into North Korea. And so, you know, they had been getting a tremendous amount of traffic on YouTube. And, you know, we had been sort of dipping and diving into TV. And we met, um, Jeff Fager at uh, CBS News, and he wanted to give us a show, and he wanted he was going to give us a show, and I was going to be a host on on 60 Minutes, and then uh, Ari Emanuel is my agent, and I called him going, <laughs> I don't need an agent, I just got the sweetest plum in the news world, and he's like, you're an idiot, you know, CBS, the affiliates will kill you, you, you can't swear, you can't do all the things that make you vice, you have to go to HBO, it's the only place for you. And so we met Richard Plepler, and it was a sort of love fest. And uh, you know, we we signed a deal with HBO, and it's been great ever since. So, so and it's uh, resulted in you getting that uh, Emmy behind you, which you won a, a couple of years ago, uh, yeah. your first year. Uh, you got it, and you also helped Bill Maher get his uh, Emmy, the Emmy that's been eluding him his whole career. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, you uh, for the informational series uh, category, you chose uh, the first two episodes of the season, the one on uh, Assad's uh, Syria and climate change, and also the one on trans youth. Uh, what, what made you choose to submit those episodes for Emmy consideration? Well, I think it's a good encapsulation of, of you know what Vice is doing. I think that Assad's Syria is interesting because uh, up to very recently, Assad staying in power was just unthinkable, and now it's going to happen. And, you know, just going to see what that looks like and how eerily that looks like 1984 where with, you know, thought police and, you know, people just disappearing and continual warfare and, you know, people... I mean, I think the most haunting part of that for me is literally standing in the rubble of a city, like a completely destroyed city of Homs, saying, you know, did the government do anything wrong? And, and then saying, nope, the government's great. They didn't do anything wrong. And meanwhile, the whole city is leveled. So I think that was great. 
I think also our commitment to environmental programming, despite having a cabinet um, of all climate change deniers, which is just mind blowing. Um, <clears throat> and I think showing the ongoing lawsuit against Exxon, where that climate change denial comes from, of Exxon paying politicians to be climate deniers, even though they, they have the science and know that climate change is happening and is man-made, they're still paying politicians to say that it isn't. So I think that's important. And then I think with trans youth, I think it's, we're at a, uh, a point of the cultural zeitgeist where it's sort of, you know, it's a very misunderstood uh, 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 topic. And I think when you see these young kids, you know, who are five and, and six and seven years old saying, I'm a girl or I'm a boy, uh, and their parents, you know, I think, again, the telling point of like died in the wool Republican Christian family who have a trans kid who's just naturally trans and the, and the family has lost all of their friends and they're out there fighting these, you know, uh, Republican uh, uh, leaders that they used to uh, uh, adhere to. I think it's just it's timely and it's and it's an important story. So um, I just thought uh, you you uh, I would want to go back to some you said about uh, some of the online video content you did. You said you went to North Korea. D did yeah. you go to North Korea? Yeah, I went twice, and I did two documentaries in North Korea. And then my documentaries were harshly critical of the regime, so I got banned from North Korea. But um, congratulations, by the way. Thank you. But I, <clears throat> I. I sort of figured out that, you know, they have this magic basketball that Michael Jordan signed that Madeleine Albright uh, brought over um, that's in the House of Treasures. And uh, they love basketball. They love the Chicago Bulls. So we figured out, okay, if we could get some Chicago Bulls to go, uh, we could probably get, uh, you know, a good documentary out of it. And, you know, Scottie Pippen and Michael Jordan, uh, not surprisingly, said no. But Dennis Rodman, not surprisingly, said yes. And so we went over... And, uh, and he went for a couple of days. We shot a whole documentary. He's over there again now, so we've created a monster. But, um, uh, yeah, so that, the, 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 the documentary in the first season of, of Vice on HBO uh, was started when I was in uh, North Korea shooting for uh, Just Vice. And uh, I'm just curious, what what are you, what were your impressions of it? Because North Korea has always fascinated me. I've, I've actually always wanted to go. To go. Um, I really, I really want to, and uh, maybe just like a day trip. I don't want it to stay too long. Um, I mean, it really is. It's like going back in time. It's like going to, you know, Stalinist Russia in the '30s or Maoist China in the '50s. It's total isolationist, cult of personality. You know, communist utopian society. Um, everyone always asks me, you know, do they believe this stuff? And you're like, yeah. They don't have phones, they don't have computers, they don't have, you know, TV, and, and if they do, it just is complete propaganda controlled by the state. You know, their picture, the picture of Kim Il-sung, Kim uh, Jong-il, are in, it's, you know, are in every room, literally, you want to talk about Big Brother, in every room there's two pictures. And so they, they believe it, you know, they don't know, you know, that the only thing that they can see is that when Chinese tourists come in, which is the majority of the people coming into North Korea, they used to look like them. You know, they would wear sort of Maoist suits and have party badges and stuff. And now they come in Hawaiian, you know, shirts and, and shorts and have cam. They look like American tourists. And so they've noticed that something there is happening. But if you go today, it's like going back in time to when the Cold War was at its peak. And I find that fascinating. Um, you know, the power of propaganda, the power of cult of personality is very interesting. Um, but, you know, you can see or you can smell that it's got to come to an end at some point. It just doesn't work. So I, I, I have so many questions about that I want to ask you, but I think I'll have to say that for another time because there are other questions that I prepared for this. And what sort of journalist would I be if I just threw everything to the side? Um, uh, so I'm wondering, it, with Vice now, you pointed out something interesting in your uh, House Divided uh, special, which is being submitted for the documentary special category. And um, uh, you talked about how, you know, they're with media now, they're trying to sacrifice accuracy for diverse diversity of viewpoints. Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering, 
uh, how do you approach that in terms of you know featuring you know it, it's it seems obvious to you that you are that you you understand the climate the climate science and that it's supported by the overwhelming majority of scientists but you still sometimes have to do you understand what i'm saying like having to uh, uh bring in their viewpoint to to yeah. understand where the other side's coming from how do you approach that balance well i think with the house divided it was pretty easy because when we were talking to the obama camp on their way out all they wanted to talk about was the intractability of the gop and so we had to then go talk to the GOP and we would just sort of match up stories. It would be like, well, they said this and they said this. And so I think what was shocking about that, it started out to just be sort of like, basically, you know, what is the job like? You know, what has it been like to be the first black president for the last eight years? And it ended up just being about the complete and utter dysfunction of Washington and the two party system. And I think that, you know, Obama's biggest fear is that the sort of institutions of democracy, which have kept us, you know, afloat for a long time, are now in danger from sort of populism and sort of demagogic uh, uh, philosophy. And um, so I think that was that was that was quite interesting. But I think to go back on the environmental piece, what we've decided to do rather than focus, because whenever you do something on politics, you're sort of pulled, you know, on one side or the other, and they try to throw mud at you and then you just defend yourself. And rather than actually reporting on the story, you're sort of fighting with the, the other side or if there is another side. I, you know, I don't know when the environment became an issue of the left because it should be an issue for everybody. But in answer to your question, what would happen is we would do a story on the environment and then just get flooded with, with you know, usually we're at 80, 90% positive comments and it would be 50% negative, 50% positive. And so, we said, okay, let's go talk to these people. Let's go talk to the people who are denying this. Let's go hear their side of the story. And then, so, so we would go to the Arctic. It's melting. Everyone agrees now that it's melting. Yep, okay, yep, Greenland melting, yep. But Antarctica, that's the one. Antarctica is actually growing. So we said, okay, well, if, if that's the case, we'll go down to Antarctica. And we talked to all the scientists. And the scientists are like, no, it's melting. And we said, but these guys are saying, it's not melting. And they're saying, well, there's people that believe the earth is flat too. You know, what do you want me to do? And so you just have to sort of go through the story and say, okay, well, if this is what 40% of Americans believe because they're paid, you know, it's like when, when they used to have cigarette commercials and it was like a person talking with the cigarette would come out and do the thing. Basically, so people are saying, nope, it's not happening. There's never been more ice. It's never been colder. That's literally Exxon coming out of someone's mouth and talking. And so, you know, we have to go and we have to chase it up. And rather than just say that it's utterly ludicrous, we hear their side of the story, that go down and talk to the experts about it and say, actually, that's not true. So when you said that, it made me think of like Exxon is like the little mouth alien and alien. That's, it. that's exactly right. Yeah, yeah. They pay yep. literally. So there, there's a lawsuit. Two uh, attorneys general are suing them for exactly that, for knowing that climate change is happening, knowing it's man-made knowing we can do something about it, yet spending billions of dollars to say that the science is not settled, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, actually, uh, my my attorney general actually uh, joined onto that suit, Mark Herring of Virginia. Uh, yeah. He joined onto that suit. Um, one of the things that's really interesting, or actually not interesting, it's scary right now, is the attitude towards the media, especially with the attitude that's being displayed by the current administration, yeah. Um, I, I don't think I've ever seen, and I'm, I'm only 30, but I don't think I've ever seen any, the, the, the level of just flat delegitimization that comes from this, the, the administration toward, towards uh, mainstream media. Uh, so what, I'm wondering, what is your greatest fear when it comes to this current administration as someone who is an operator of uh, media? Well, I think... You know, you have to look at other countries, and I think, you know, you have, for example, the Philippines, which has its big war on drugs, where they're, it's literally a war on drugs, where they're just killing everybody associated with it. And at the same time, they're going after journalists because they don't want people reporting the truth. And I think what it shows is the, the basis of democracy as we know it, you have to have a full and functioning free press, because otherwise, 
it just becomes Russia, it becomes North Korea, it becomes the state controlling the news, which is propaganda. I think one of the greatest coups that, you know, this, this administration has done is take real fake news, which is like sort of, you know, if you, if you did the search terms from the last election, it wasn't the New York Times or the Washington Post or anything you would think would have the top search terms. It was, you know, committee to protect the constitution or, you know, the, the second amendment fighters, you know, these guys are beating the, the New York Times. And so obviously there's some jiggery pokery going on and that's fake news. And they've switched it saying, no, the New York Times is the fake news. That's who the real fake news is. And you're like, hold on a second. It's like a kindergarten game, you know? You know, you're stinky. No, you're the one who's stinky. And so I, I'm, I'm astounded by that, but I'm also astounded by, you know, we get the government we deserve. I'm astounded by how rapidly the population is willing to pick it up. And I think that if you're a, a demagogic leader, if you're a populist leader, the first thing you want to do is delegitimize the press. Because if you do that, then all criticism goes out the window. And I think you're seeing that to some success now, that you have all of these scandals that we're not making up. You know, you, you, we're not making up things about Russia. We're not making up any of these things. Yet, it's just been like, oh, it's just the crazy press. It's just the, it's just those, the fake news guys are just, oh, it's a witch hunt, whatever. And you're like, why did you say it's a witch hunt? Because Donald Trump tweeted it's a witch hunt? I don't understand what's happening. If this was Obama, he'd be impeached right now. You know, but because it's Trump, they're like, oh, well, you know, what do you expect? <laughs> so it is a very confusing time, but it is the best time to have a news organization because it's unbelievable amounts of content every day. And uh, I'm, I'm curious. So uh, a lot of people can't believe that we're in uh, that we're in this uh, current political situation that we're in right now. Um I'm I'm curious. Uh, what was your election night like? And I was. When did you? Uh, when did it begin to truly sink in? What was happening? Uh, well, it's a very embarrassing story, actually. Please because, do tell. Well, we were having a party at my house, and uh, I have a pizza oven, and we were cooking pizzas, and they were awesome. And we were having wine, and it was awesome, and. This, this guy, he was a, one of the best chefs, is a friend of mine, and he was like cooking brisket. And we were just having a great time. And it was like sort of the men were around the, the, the pizza oven and the women were watching it. And they kept coming down sort of more and more depressed, and more and more upset. And we were just getting sort of drunker and, and, and fuller, sort of, ah, it's going to be okay. Everything's going to be okay. And I think it was maybe the best party I've ever thrown that was absolutely sort of destroyed by everybody being bummed when they left. And I was like, I woke up the next morning thinking, you know, um, I'm never going to get credit for the, how great that party was. Um, and then, and then we got to work on, on, on covering, you know, what we decided that day was that we were not going to go after the easy leads, the easy headlines and the easy Trump stuff that we were going to follow policy. Cause I said, well, what does it look like when you have Pruitt running the EPA? Who wants to dismantle the EPA? What does it look like when Perry's running the uh, you know Department of Energy and he wants to dismantle? He ran as president, saying he's going to dismantle it for for president. And you know Rex Tillerson coming over from Exxon under that uh, lawsuit uh, by the AGs um, now be, being Secretary of State, et cetera, et cetera. And so I, I said, like, you know, what's going to happen is everyone's going to be, it's like magicians, everyone's going to be watching all the tweets about everything else. And meanwhile, they're just going to be passing, you know, policy, 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 legislation, et cetera, that's going to affect people in social justice, in the environment, in our rights, and, and, and in, by the way, press freedoms going forward. And so we have to watch that, and that's our job. Yeah, I remember... Uh... Oh God! I remember. For me, when it sank, when it truly sank in, was when they called the race. Uh, the the Senate race in Wisconsin. That right. was when it really hit me. When they right. said Russ Feingold lost, I was like, "Oh, this is not good." Yeah. Yeah. Um. So, uh, one of the other things that's really interesting that you talk about in uh, House Divided is uh, about um, it's about how media 
is so uh, all over the place now. Now it's any almost anybody can be a media outlet now. Um, and that's one of the things that's, uh, I mean, it's a great thing, but it's also done a lot of damage because yeah. almost anybody can be a source now. Yeah. And I was wondering what is the greatest thing that uh, the media could do to repair the damage that's been done to American society from that? Well, I think that the problem, you know, it's funny. I was bemoaning this. I was in France and I was bemoaning the fact that if you do anything in America, they try to pull you into the mire of, of sort of paradigmic or, um, you know, sort of polemic fighting, uh, partisan fighting any of the P words. And so I was sort of saying, you know, it's so bad right now. We can't report on the stories. It's just infighting. And he's like, what do you think media is? Mr. Reuter bought a newspaper because he didn't like the other guy writing about him. We've always been fighting. It's rich people using media to fight each other. Wake up, you know, kind of thing. I was like, oh, well. Um, but I think that what's happened and what we've fallen prey to is this sort of folksy, can do, can you believe what the left are saying, these communist Bernie Sanders, on the on the right and on the left is sort of snobby comedy like oh my god <clears throat> excuse me oh my god can you believe what they what they're saying in Oklahoma today you know and what we learned in House Divided is all of the outrage and all of the freaking out that we're doing under Trump you know 30 40 percent of the com uh, country was doing every day under Obama but just on weird media outlets and talk radio and, and, you know, these sort of weird podcasts and, you know, info wars and stuff like that. And so, you know, what, what seemed to be niche and, and crazy was actually representing a zeitgeist. But what happened is people were becoming so polarized that there's no such thing. It's, it's quite scary because there's no such thing as a commonality of facts and there can be no real debate. There can be no real journalism unless you have a com commonality of facts, i.e., okay, the world is warming. The world is warming, so what do we do about it? We can debate, well, can we, you know, stopping cars versus industrial pollution or what have you. But if you just say it's not warming, that's not true. There is no commonality of facts. You can't even begin to have that discussion. And that's where we are, sadly, in America today, is we do not have a commonality of facts to even begin the dialogue, which means that we are hopelessly polarized and there is no real sense that this is going to sort of move to the middle back to any kind of consensus, which means we can become increasingly dysfunctional. Oh, so on that note, um, <laughs> um, uh, on I... Uh, there is one last question I wanted to ask. I'm, I'm sure uh, you, uh, Vice would love to get to sit down and interview uh, President Trump um, if they were ever to get a chance. I'm sure you probably tried to get a sit down with him. Uh, I was wondering if uh, if you could interview Donald Trump, what would be the first thing you would ask him? Well, is it real? Like, is this real? Like, what... Because I think that, in a way, if we're talking about media on your, on your show, he's created the greatest reality TV show ever. And the problem is, is it has political ramifications. So how much of this is, is real? Like, how much of this is driven by a real political vision? And how much is just him being P.T. Barnum and Bailey, uh, you know, ultimate showman, just saying, hey, this is fun. I'll do this for a while. Because I think, and I smell it, but I get, I get this, you know, that I'm sort of a news guy or a guy that entertainment ties to the news. And, and I smell with him kind of like, oh, shit, I won this thing. And he's doing what he knows how to do best, which is to aggrandize and to entertain and to sort of froth things up, but he doesn't understand, you know, the political ramifications. I think people around him do, 
And a lot of people are hoping that he'll be a Reagan, where sort of Reagan was the actor, and then the cabinet got all of the things done, and now everybody wants to say, oh, there's none more Reagan than me. But I, I think that, I mean, the Republicans want to be, there's none more Reagan than me. They want to be, you know, as close as they possibly can to him. But Trump's not Reagan. And, you know, I, I would, from one, you know, media guy to another, I'd be like, okay, how much of this is, is, is driven by political ideology? And how much of this is just like, I don't know, I'm here, isn't this wild? It's, and the strangest thing is, I don't think, I don't think anyone beyond his family truly knows. Mm -hmm. I don't think, I think it's just, it's just a crazy time we live in. Well, uh, get out of it. <laughs> we we hope we hope <laughs> well uh shane thanks so much for joining us uh we wish you all the best during the season thank you very much